There's a saying attributed to Newton that he saw as far as he did, he got as far as he did with math and science because he stood on the shoulders of giants. Stand on the shoulders of giants you can see further. Right. What giants did Newton stand on the shoulders of? Well, Aristotle for one thing. Uh, Archimedes. Euclid, ancient Greek mathematicians and scientists. Um, people like Fermat and Descartes, I believe, lived a little bit before Newton. Okay, so we can also say the same thing. When I said Newton and Leibniz didn't fully understand what they were doing, that's true. <coughs> but you can because you can stand on the shoulders of giants. I, not me, I'm not a giant, okay? I'm standing on some, uh, some other giant's shoulders. You can stand with me, okay? I can help you see further. And we can in some ways at least more, more fully understand things better. Let's illustrate the velocity and acceleration with an example. Actually, let's keep this up here. Let's do the example on the board. Let's do the function that I gave you the hint about for taking its derivative over the Moodle message. What's if this is position, what's velocity? And by the way, let's also think about the graphs. This would be the graph of position versus time for this function. What does this represent physically? Well, you can't literally start at time zero for this example, because at time zero, you're off at infinity, so to speak. So you'd have to start at some other small positive time with this example. But you are, S is decreasing with respect to time. You're coming from very, very far away positively and rushing in a spaceship really fast, maybe near the speed of light or something, toward position one, say, and then position one half. You're slowing down because this graph is kind of gave up. Does that make sense? So you're moving really, really fast because this graph is so high at first and has a very steep slope. You've got a very high negative velocity at first, but then as this graph levels off, you're coming toward position zero, which let's say is here, and you're asymptotically approaching, so you're slowing down a lot. You never quite stop. You're just moving really, really small steps, right? Because this never quite reaches zero. What's the velocity in such a situation? It's negative, because you're going in the negative direction. That's the positive direction. You started way out there close to infinity, and you're coming towards zero very rapidly at first and then slowing down. You're moving in the negative direction, even though your position is always positive. You're moving that way. So the velocity has got to be a negative function here. Very high negative value, so to speak. <coughs> large negative value is probably a better way to say that because you have a very large negative slope here. Then it gets to be a smaller negative value, closer to zero. the words large and small in terms of how close you are to zero in that case. Let's go ahead and do the limit definition here. And you should carry the limit sign along. Remember I said on the hint that I gave you, you want to write it that way, and then you want to subtract these fractions, you need to get a common denominator. The denominator there, I think you had it like a t equals 2 or something, but we're just doing it for a general t here. The common denominator will be t times t plus h. Right, just multiply those two denominators. Then subtract the fractions. What's going to be in the numerator of this fraction if the denominator is that? Well, to get a t in the denominator there, I need to multiply the denominator by 2, by t. So I also need to multiply the numerator by t. Minus, what's going to happen with this one? I need to multiply the top and the bottom by t plus h. To get an extra two, t plus h down there, so i got to do it to the top too. Put a t plus h up here. The t's cancel when you distribute the minus sign through. And you're left with...
you can now cancel those H's, divide them out. The negative sign doesn't go away, it stays there. And you're left with something that if you pretend T is a fixed positive number, say, this is continuous at H equals zero. If T is positive, you're not going to be divided by zero. So you can now evaluate this limit by substituting in H equals zero. So you end up with negative 1 over t squared for the group. <coughs> What's the graph of that look like? For t positive, it looks like that. It's giving you the slopes of this. You start off with a very negative slope, large negative slope, just like the value of this function is very large and negative number. You're moving towards zero fast. Fat really faster than the speed of light. <laughs> We're modeling something moving faster than the speed of light if I start close enough to time equals zero here, which you know in real life can't happen. You can't go faster than the speed of light. In real life, but I can in my imagination. This is down past negative of the speed of light, but it heads up towards zero. Just like the slope here starts out large and negative and heads towards zero, staying negative. The second derivative is going to be the acceleration. Now, I'm not going to go through the limit calculation again. At least not the entire thing, but let's, let's at least start it. We have f primes here. So that's going to be negative 1 over t plus h quantity squared minus 1 over t squared all over h. And you would actually simplify it in a pretty similar situation, similar way. You have to subtract these. Oops, I made a mistake. You'd have to combine those fractions by getting a common denominator. Have the dividing by h as a one over h being multiplied out in front. After simplifying, you should be able to cancel the h's. <coughs> and here's what you would get in this case. You get positive two over t cubed. Turns out to be the answer. I encourage you to check that after class. <coughs> I'm really using, to figure that out in my head so quick, something called the power rule, which is in the book in section 2.3. So if you've been doing your reading, you know about this. If f of x equals x to the n power, where n can be any power, positive or negative or fractional or even something like pi, then f prime of x is n times x to the n minus 1 power. It's like you're bringing n out in front as a multiplier and subtract one from the x prime. If there's anything people typically remember 50 years after they take calculus, it's this. Okay? But just because you know this doesn't mean you know calculus. In fact, to emphasize that point, Professor Conrath in our math department, back when her kids were younger, when they were like two, three, four years old, she videotaped them saying, if f of x is x to the n, then f prime of x is n times x to the n minus 1. She taught her four-year-old kids to say that. Just to emphasize that just because you know this doesn't mean you know calculus. They, don't, they didn't know calculus, obviously. They were just saying what you told them to say. They memorized it. Okay? This is actually somewhat difficult to prove, except for special cases like n is 1, 2, 3, 4. That is not too bad. But for general n, this is actually kind of difficult to prove. You can take this to the bank, though, and use it from now on whenever you need to. Especially when, the, especially when the book says use the power rule or use rules for differentiation. Mm -hmm. Do we not need to go through the definition of the limit then? Uh, unless the book says do it algebraically, okay. they mean do the limit when they okay. say that. And how did I know this is the answer then? It's because, uh, come over here, this was f prime of t. And as a power, it's negative t to the negative 2. 
So it's derivative. The negative sign turns out to just get carried along. You bring down that negative 2, subtract 1 from the exponent. Negative 2 minus 1 is negative 3. Then these two negative signs would cancel, and you could write this as 2 over t cubed. That's how I knew the answer. I was thinking about the power rule. It works even when the exponent is a negative number. But when you subtract 1 from negative 2, you get negative 3, not negative 1. Careful. Section 2.4 is a section we haven't talked about yet. That's going to be the remaining remainder of our time today. <coughs> today, so far, I've essentially done section 2.3, and then I skipped ahead to 2.5 a bit. That's on the second derivatives. 2.4 is in between. On interpreting derivatives, in other examples besides physics, say. <coughs> and here's your typical kind of problem. We'll do as many as we can with these in the time that we have remaining. Capital T in degrees Fahrenheit of a cold yam. I never knew it until recently that a yam is the same as a sweet potato. They're the same thing. Okay. Of a cold yam, imagine eating a cold sweet potato. It's kind of hard. Oh no, I guess it was in the oven. So it's cooling. Okay? The temperature is a function of time. Capital T is a function of little t. Part A, what is the sign of its derivative and why? Part B, what are the units of a certain derivative value? Uh, sorry, that goes over the, the one line to the next there. And what's its meaning and approximate the value of this function? To try to answer these questions, I think it's best to try to make a reasonable graph. <coughs> oh no, I'm sorry. Okay, the, the yam is heating up. I thought it was cooling down. When you're reading from this direction, you're quite, it's hard to read. So the yam, the yam is heating up. It's cold to start with, it heats up in the oven. We don't know what the oven temperature is. Evidently, the units here yeah, are in Fahrenheit for degrees. Bad, bad, bad. We shouldn't use in Celsius, but oh well. Or Kelvin, for that matter, right? The oven temperature is, you know, in Fahrenheit probably is like 350 or something. At t equals 20, the yam has heated up to 150. This point would be on the graph. What do you think the graph looks like? It's heating up, so it's got to be increasing, right? Do you think it's concave down or straight or maybe <coughs> both concave up and concave down? Hard to say for sure, isn't it? Turns out it's actually this one. It's going to be concave down. Let me make my t-axis lower here. It's got to heat up fast at first. Think in extremes. If you put an ice cube in a fire, it heats up really fast. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't say an ice cube because it's got to melt first. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, really cold water. Pour really cold water in a fire. Okay, the water molecules heat up really fast. Become steam essentially instantly. At first, the yam's got to heat up rapidly. As you approach the oven temperature, you can't pass the oven temperature. It can't get hotter than the oven. So it's got to level off. It's got to be concave down. You might wonder about this possibility, but that's not the best model. 
So based on thinking about the fact that the function's increasing, the sine of f prime has to be what? <coughs> positive, right? It can only be positive or negative by sine, S I G M. <coughs> the slopes are in are positive. You not ask for the sine of f double prime because it's, this is before the second derivative section. But if I asked you for f double prime sine, you'd have to say if that truly is the graph, positive or negative? No, negative. Concave down corresponds to negative second derivative. The second derivative is the derivative of the derivative. Well, I haven't graphed the derivative there, but I can still think about it. It's, it's giving you the slopes of this, which start out large, then decrease towards zero. The slopes are decreasing. The graph of the derivative would be decreasing. So the second derivative of the original function has to be negative. And it gave down as the negative second derivative. What are the units of f prime equaling two? Time was in minutes. It's a rate of change, a slope. As with all slopes then, its units have to be the units on the vertical axis per unit of the horizontal axis. Degrees per minute, per minute. that should make sense. At some time, if the derivative is 2, that means at that moment in time, the yam is heating up at this rate, 2 degrees Fahrenheit every minute. So if you leave it in there an extra minute, it's going to be 2 degrees warm. You leave it in there an extra 2 minutes, it'll be about 4 degrees warm. An extra 3 minutes, it's about 6 degrees warm. Is that a perfect approximation? No, it is an approximation. That helps you do this approximation. F of 23, let's think of it this way first. The change in temperature, F of 23 minus F of 20, is going to be approximately the rate of change times the time elapsed. 2 times 3, 6. F prime of 20. I think there's, there's a typo up there. Times three. I think I meant to have a 20 here as well. Yeah. Sorry about that. So more fully what the derivative is saying is the rate of change of temperature with respect to time at time 20 minutes is 2 degrees Fahrenheit per minute. That's worth writing down. rate of change, instantaneous rate of change if you want to be more precise, of temperature, capital T, with respect to, you can abbreviate WRT, time, little t, at t equals 20 minutes, is 2 degrees Fahrenheit per minute. I know that's a lot to write, but write it. Okay, it's essential that you really get this. The rate of change, the derivative of the dependent variable, capital T, temperature, with respect to the independent variable, time, little t, at time 20 minutes is 2 degrees Fahrenheit per minute. saying the slope of the tangent is 2. If I can draw it. There's the tangent line. Its slope is 2. To find then the change in the function over the interval from time 20 to time 23, a 3 minute time interval, 
approximate that by multiplying the rate of change times the amount of time elapsed. This is in degrees Fahrenheit per minute. This 3 is in minutes. So that's 2 times 3, or 6. And the minutes cancel, getting you degrees Fahrenheit. I'm not done. I want to know f of 23, not f of 23 minus f of 20. But hey, I already know f of 20. It's 150. So I can solve for f of 23 here. f of 23 is approximately f of 20 plus f prime of 20 times 3, which can be thought of as 23 minus 20, if you like. That's the three minute time interval. 150 plus 2 times 3, 150 plus 6 is 156 degrees. This should look familiar. That's why I was typing the Mathematica with the sine function, with pi over 3 in lecture A. It's a linear, it's called a linear approximation. You don't have to write 23 minus 20, you could just write a 3. But I'm trying to emphasize the starting time is 20, the ending time is 23. Quite right. Second example. Investing $1,000 at an annual interest rate of R percent for 10 years gives you a balance of B dollars, where B is then a function of the interest rate. It's compounded continuously every moment of every day, which makes you think maybe E should be involved, but I'm not positive that that's what they want when they say the annual interest rate is R percent. They probably do want E involved. I could write down a formula for this function. Let me go ahead and do it. It's not required to answer the questions. With continuous compounding, you a thousand dollar initial deposit. This is a little tricky. R is given as a percent. So R is going to be not a real small number, but a slightly bigger number like 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or 5, not 0.01 or 0.02 or 0.03 or 0.04, because they put the percent sign after it. This is, this example is taken from the book. So you actually want to write R over 100 here, times the number of years. So if R, for example, is 4, then this 4 over 100 really is the same as 0.04. Anyway, that would be the formula. You actually don't need the formula to solve the problem. The formula is not what the problem is about. The formula is they're just thinking about this function and its graph. They don't ask you to draw the graph, but I think it's helpful, and I think you should make a habit of this on the section 2.4 homework due next Monday. You draw a graph so it'll help you personally understand better and be more likely to get a right answer. It'll help the grader too, probably. If you make a mistake, they'll be able to see what you were thinking. Even though you're not asked to draw graphs, I highly, highly recommend it. Money grows with compound interest gives rise to an increasing and concave up graph. The graph's going to look like that. You're told g of 5 is 1649. 5 here really representing 5%. In the formula, this would be a 0 0.05 then. This is 1649. And you're told that g prime of 5 is 165. The slope of the tangent line right here 
is g prime of 5 is 165. This is in units of dollars here, because B is in dollars. R is an interest rate. What are its units? Percents? Actually, it's best to call them percentage points. I don't want to explain why that's a better thing to call them. Other than just to say that when you say an interest rate increases by two percentage points, you mean it, is, it has increased like maybe from 5% to 7% or 6% to 8% or 10% to 12%. What are the units for the derivative? I guess that's answering part B. Of the financial interpretations for A first of all. A is telling you that, a time, that when the, the uh, interest rate is 5%, your balance after 10 years is $1,649. It's a little different than most compound interest problems. Time is not the independent variable. The interest rate is as percentage points. The derivative at 165 is probably best explained why you talk about the units at the same time. G prime of 5 equaling 165 means, let's go ahead and use the same language that we used over there. The rate of change of the balance, the final balance, B in dollars with respect to R, the interest rate, as a percent, but not without not just converting to a decimal without a percent, is $165 per percentage point. What does that mean? What's the interpretation? That's part of the interpretation, but it's not quite as full as it could be. It's good to add on an extra bit of information with regard to that. That means, for example, that if the interest rate increased from 5 to 6%, the final balance after 10 years would go up by about $165. Catch that? That means if the interest rate were to increase by one percentage point here from five to six, the final balance after 10 years would increase from, by about this much, from 1649 to 1649 plus 165. Which would be what, 814, 16, 1814, something like that? Let's go ahead and write that down. So, for example, f of or g of 6 would be approximately g of 5 plus g prime of 5 times 1, which I can think of as 6 minus 5 because r increased from 5 to 6. This would be 1649 plus 165 times 1. $1,814. Did I say $15? $14. Is that approximation too big or too small? It's a tangent line approximation. Essentially, I'm using this linear function to approximate the nonlinear function at 6. You can see the tangent line is below the graph of the function because the function is concave up. So its output is going to be too low. You're actually going to have a bit more than 1814. I got more examples. We're close to being out of time. Let me just quickly go over the examples verbally without writing anything on the board. 
Listen carefully. Just got three minutes to concentrate here. For some painkillers, the size of the dose D depends on the weight of the person. D is a function of W. As the weight increases, probably you need a bigger dose. Probably it's an increase in the function. Now for 40 is 120. In other words, when somebody weighs 140 uh, pounds, the dose is 120, did they get units? Milligrams. This is the rate of change of dosage with respect to weight. When a person weighs 140, the rate of change is 3 milligrams per pound. For every extra pound you add, you need more, 3 more milligrams. So F of 141, for example, would be about 123. It's hard to say whether that one would be concave up or concave down, I think. If I had to guess, I'd say concave down, but I might be wrong. Here, G of V is the fuel efficiency in miles per gallon of a car going at V miles per hour. What are the units of G prime of 90, and, and what is the, is the practical meaning of this statement? I copied this out of the book. I don't know why they put a 90 there, and not, not just a 55. Let's just look at this thing. G prime of 55 equals negative 0.54. The input is what? It's a... <coughs> Velocity, a speed really, miles per hour. When you're going 55 miles per hour, which used to be the standard speed limit for all freeways back 30 years ago. Yes, I'm not lying, you may have heard that. It's negative 0.54. The rate of change of fuel efficiency in miles per gallon is negative 0.54 miles per gallon per mile per hour, right? Fuel efficiency per speed. Whoa. Mile per gallon per mile per hour. It's negative, so for every extra mile per hour you go, your fuel efficiency goes down. You get less miles per gallon. Right? You want miles per gallon to be high, right? That's better fuel efficiency. But if you go past 55, the car is becoming less efficient. Your mileage, gas usage goes down. You use more gas. Your fuel efficiency goes down. I'm not going to go over this one, but there are problems about costs as well. We'll go over this one on next Monday. Have a good long weekend. <coughs>